All right. So, go ahead and go ahead and um. Uh, Go ahead and uh, get today's title and objective copy down, and we will get started. All right, so let's remind ourselves what a polynomial is. A polynomial is a function that can be written as f of x equals a to the x, ax to the n, plus bx to the n minus 1, plus cx plus cx to the n minus 2, and so on, until we end with just a number times x plus a number. For a, b, c, and so on are numbers, and x is x. Now, these polynomials don't necessarily need to be written, don't necessarily need to be written like this, but they need to be able to be written like this. Now, the highest exponent n is the degree of the polynomial. The coefficient on that term is the leading co is the leading coefficient
We learned in a previous lesson that the leading coefficient and the degree determine the overall shape of the function. So let's look at an example of a polynomial of a polynomial. f of x equals 3x squared minus 4x cubed plus 2 plus x. This is a polynomial. Now, it's not written as a polynomial right now, but I could rewrite it so that I have negative 4x squared plus 3x, or negative 4x cubed plus 3x squared plus x plus 2. Then that would be in polynomial form. Now, this particular polynomial has degree 3. And the leading coefficient. of negative four. Now, one last thing I'll note about polynomials. This is all stuff that we've learned already. One last, one thing that I'll note about polynomials is that you should note that each term is a monomial. We learned what monomials are uh, a few lessons ago. So a polynomial, therefore, is a sum of monomials. Okay. So, will anyone yell at me if I take this away? Okay, let me know when you're ready. All right. Now, in a previous lesson, we learned about three basic types of polynomials. Linear function, uh, constant functions, which are uh, polynomials of degree zero. Linear functions, which are polynomials of degree one, and quadratic functions, which are polynomials of degree two. Today, we're going to start learning about higher order polynomials, higher degree polynomials, polynomials of degrees three and four.
polynomials of degree three are called cubic functions. And it makes sense why they're called cubic functions. As their highest exponent is a three. So somewhere in there it has an x cubed. Likewise, polynomials of degree four are called Wordic functions. An example of a quartic function might be something like. 2x to the fourth power minus 3x squared plus three. Our highest exponent is four. All right. Now let's talk about the basic shapes of these functions. Now we're actually already pr pretty familiar with the basic shape y x cubed. So this is y equals x cubed. Well, we already know. Y, y equals x cubed is an odd function. It starts at the lower left, moves up, flattens out near the origin, moves back. No problems there. What about y equals x to the fourth? Well, we actually already learned a little. Uh, we actually learned know what y equals x to the fourth would look like from previous lessons. 
it's an even function, so it's going to be symmetrical about the origin. And if I plug in one, or it's not symmetrical about the origin, it's going to be symmetrical about the y-axis. Plugging in one will get me a one. It's even, so we'll, another point will be over there. So it's going to be going down and then up again. Plugging in zero will get us zero, so it'll go through there. So it kind of looks like it might look uh, kind of like a parabola. And it will indeed look kind of like a parabola. Pretty similar. Not quite exactly the same. y equals x to the fourth looks a lot like a parabola, but not quite identical. So, the parabola goes y equals x squared. So they both have the same general kind of u shape. But x to the fourth has square has squarier corners down at the bottom and steeper sides. So it comes down, has steep sides. then turns up. It doesn't have square sides, but they are squarer than x, than, um, uh, than a uh, parabola. Now, one last basic thing that I will note about uh, one last thing I'll note about cubics and quartics. That Both cubics and quartics can be transformed using the usual transformations. Translating Et so let's go ahead and go over to Desmos and let me just show you what I mean when I say that it can be they can be given the usual transfer. They have something like y equals x to the third power. Well, we can transform it by doing all the transformations you learned about in previous lessons. I could say add one to shift it up. I could replace x with x minus two to shift it right. I could multiply by, say, 5 to give it a vertical stretch. Put it all together, and I can move. And I can vertically stretch, vertically squish, move left, right. Up, down, 
we can use all the standard transfer. Same thing with x to the fourth power. Left, right, up, down, vertical stretch, vertical squish, and of course, if our k is negative, then it'll flip upside down. All right, nothing weird so far. But there is something that makes the higher degree functions different from the lower degree functions. All right. So something that we learned about uh, about parabola, the quadratic functions. If my function is a quadratic, let's say y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. As long as it is a quadratic, as long as it is a degree two polynomial, then it will always be a parabola. I might be able to shift the parabola up and down. Kind of wiggle it and wobble it. Even, even stretch it vertically flip it upside down, but it's always going to be a parabola. It always has the same basic shape, just transformed in a few simple ways. But that is not the case for uh, cubics. If I say add x, or let's even subtract x, now its shape seems to have changed dramatically. It's still overall moving from lower left to upper right. But simply subtracting an X has introduced some new features that weren't there originally. This doesn't happen with quadratics. So today we're going to learn about, we're going to learn some about how these changes can happen, what stays the same, what determines the overall shape, and what determines the finer structures. All right. Blue and yell at me if I take this away. Do. So, before we talk about how to change these graphs, let's talk about what stays the same when I make these changes. So, if I have something like x cubed and I say subtract of 3x, our function looks quite different. But note that our it's still going from lower left to upper right. Now let's see what happens when we zoom out for a while. Zoom out a ways. Now if we zoom out, 
then we can see that after a while, the two lines start to overlap. Now they're not exactly overlapping. There's always going to be a gap in there. But for larger values of x, two functions, or the two functions, y equals x cubed and y equals x cubed, in this case, minus 3x, start to look pretty similar. Same thing if I'm working with a quartic. If I say subtract 3x from x to the fourth power, then zooming in on the center shows that there's been a big change. But once I zoom out, I see that it's still starting up high, going down, and ending up high. The further away from the origin I am, the closer those lines seem to match. So what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that the behavior of the function when we're zoomed out is determined by the leading term. So, So The behavior of a polynomial <clears throat> at large values of x, both positive and negative. is strongly related to the leading term. Or to put it another way, Zoom out from a polynomial. So the shape of the function Just like the leading term.
zooming out, the two lines seem to overlap more and more. When zoomed in, they look different. But when zoomed out, they look closer and closer together. All right. Now, what about all the other terms? Well, what do they do? How do those change the shape? Well, let's say we have something like y equals, I don't know, 3x, 3x to the third, but I'll say just, and let's say that we're comparing it to x to the third power minus x squared minus two. I'm gonna minus like x squared. That'll make it look good. Now, once again, our functions look quite different when we're zoomed in, but when we zoom out, they start to match more and more. When you're zoomed out quite a way, then the functions look basically the same. But what's determining all this close-in behavior? Well, let's just take everything except the leading function and let's make a function out of that. Or accept the leading term. Oh, look at that. For x values, for small x values, it's looking an awful, our function in, our function in green looks an awful lot like just a function made up of the non-leading terms. The more we zoom in, the more they overlap and look identical. So, so the behavior of, let's say, or of a polynomial. There we go. So the behavior of a polynomial at small values of x strongly related to the non-leading terms. Or to put it in a bit more plain English, you zoom in on a polynomial, the graph will look just like graph of the non 
leading Now, will anyone yell at me if I take this away? All right. So let's uh, work with Desmos a little bit more. Let's look at just another example so I can maybe convince you that this is true. So let's say that we have something like x to the, let's say x to the fourth power minus how to know. Actually, no, we'll make it like plus 3x cubed minus x, let's say minus uh, 8x squared. OK. So for large values, so we have this big, freaky looking thing here with a lot of places where it dips up and down and up again. We'll talk more about those in a moment. But um, uh, for large, when zoomed out, it looks just like x to the fourth. You can see that as I zoom out, move away from the origin, its behavior is just like that of x, to the, is very similar to that of x to the fourth. But when zoomed in, it looks just like 3x cubed minus 8x squared plus 1. All right. Now let's go ahead and talk about these lumps and bumps. These places where the function turns around. Now those those happen where those happen in places where our leading term and our non-leading terms kind of disagree. They want to go in different directions. A quartic function wants to go down and then up again, whereas a cubic function just wants to go nothing but up. So the place where they disagree here, that's the place where we switch from the cubic's influence to the quartic. Now, and they're called schema. So the places the graph a 
as a peak or a valley. are called local extreme. So if I make a quick sketch, This particular function has one, two, three, four local extrema. Now, this is a little bit of a scary phrase, so let's break it down really quick. An extrema is a high, a highest, or lowest point. So the extreme value of a function is whatever its highest place is, or lowest place. Now we are, these little peaks and valleys, they aren't necessarily the highest or the lowest place. This, the function is going higher than that the function is going lower than the valley. So these are called what are, these are called local. Local meaning nearby. So for example, this point might not be the lowest point around. It's lower over here, it's lower down here, but it is the lowest in its neighborhood. Likewise, this point is not the highest nearby but it is the highest in its neighborhood. Now the number of extrema, of local extrema that a function can have is determined by its degree. A polynomial of degree n has at most n minus 1 local extreme. Extreme. So for example, if we go back to Desmos for just a sec, how many local extrema does x to the fourth plus three x cubed minus eight x squared plus one half? It has one there, one there, and one way down here. So this function has three local extrema, three is four. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that um, uh, this is, that doesn't necessarily mean that our function will that a polynomial will always have that many. For example, x to the fourth plus three x cubed only has one local extreme down here. But the point <coughs> that a polynomial of degree say four could never have more than three local extremes. Polynomial of degree six. never have more than five. Okay, now local extrema are important, are actually really, really important for real life applications, though you probably won't see too many of those applications until calculus, because local e extrema are very useful 
features defined. For example, if I have a graph that graphs, say, profits depending on how much money I invest. If I invest too much money into it, then I'm now never going to make that money back. I'm not going to make a, a profit. If I don't invest enough, then it doesn't have enough to get up off the ground. So if I make a graph starting at the amount I gain from the money invested, then the local extremes where I get the most profit out of them. All right. Now, another important feature of a polynomial are what we call their zeros, or their x-intercepts. So if we go back to Desmos for just a second. So let's say I have O oh, y equals x to the third power minus x. So we see here it's degree three and it has two local maxima and it has one, two, three x intercepts. Now it turns out that the number of x-intercepts can never exceed your degree. Or in other words, a polynomial degree n has no more than n x-intercepts. Now, a polynomial of degree n could have fewer than n x-intercepts. I could make a polynomial of degree 3 with one x-intercept, for example. But I could never make a polynomial of degree 4 that has four x-intercepts. Now, one more thing. X-intercepts are also called Zero. All right. Now, anyway, I think we'll go ahead and leave off that lesson there. We'll talk more about higher order polynomials in a later lesson, or in uh, tomorrow, or maybe. So, today, we learned about uh, higher degree polynomials. We learned that the, their behavior when zoomed out is determined mostly by their largest term. Their behavior when zoomed in is determined by all of the other terms. And uh, we learned that the number of local extrema is always, can, can never exceed uh, the degree of the polynomial minus one, and the number of zeros can never exceed the degree of the polynomial. Now, we will learn more about this in a later lesson. So I will see you guys. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.